Thanks everyone for joining us. I'm so delighted today to introduce uh, Clinica Mokwena and so grateful that she agreed to join us in this virtual format from South Africa. Of course, it would be much nicer, I think, to be doing this in person, but since that not, that's not possible, I do really appreciate you taking the time at um, kind of a late hour to do this for us. Um, Khalifa received her um, PhD from the University of Cape Town in 2005. She is currently um, an associate professor and a researcher at Weiser, the Witz Institute for Social and Economic Research in Johannesburg. Um, before this, from 2006 to 2015, she taught in the Department of Anthropology at Columbia University um, in New York. And one of the most impressive um, aspects, I think, of Clinifa's body of work is the range of topics that she works on and writes about, um, intellectual history, religion, literature, visual culture, and more, and also the accompanying range of journals and other venues in which her work has appeared. Um, her articles have been published in Journal of Natal and Zulu History, Journal of Religion in Africa, Journal of Southern African Studies, Ufahamu, Journal of African History, Kronos, interventions, I could go on and so on and so forth. Um, the point is, this is a really impressive range of journals in which she has published. And today she's going to be talking to us about photography as historical fiction. I'm very much looking forward to her talk and to the discussion afterwards. And now I will turn it over to you, Fanifa. Thank you so much, Neil. And uh, thank you colleagues for inviting me uh, to Africa at noon. Um, yes. Johannesburg is uh, dark, but if you hear sirens, that's just the flavor of uh, Joburg and living in the city in Johannesburg. Um, thank you so much to um, Diana for organizing everything and making sure that um, I'm, I'm able to join you, sound, technical issue. So hopefully the technical issues don't let us down. Um, so in South Africa, we have something called load shedding. So today there's no load shedding. So if it suddenly goes dark, then it means the power company has decided to take my power, but it hardly ever happens. So I would have gotten a notice to tell me. Um, so that's the only eventuality that I'm anticipating. So everything else should go according to plan. I'm about to start sharing uh, my screen. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of a context. This is actually, the penultimate chapter of a book that I'm trying to finish on Zulu uh, men in military and police service. And because of the nature of the research, I actually have chosen to call the, their services war work rather than keep trying to distinguish between policing and the military. So this chapter is the, the, the paper that I'm going to present is a chapter in the book. And so if I make references to this chapter, it means the chapter in the book. So this is ult ultimately supposed to be a, a book project. Um, this is my screen. I hope that everyone can see it. Um, if you cannot see the visuals or you need a more tactile um, feel of the images, um, Diana has got a copy of a PDF file that you can request and that can be sent to you so you can see the images if you prefer that. So the chapter or the my presentation will start off with me reading for about 10 or 15 minutes um, as an introduction and then I will speak to the rest of the images. So I start with an epi epigraph um, and I quote, he then pointed out that he who worked many hours administering the law for government had no salary. He had a good mind to stop doing this work and go back to the mine where he used to earn 10 pounds a month as a boss boy, end of quote. In 1940, Max Gluckman, the famed founder of the Manchester School of Anthropology, published the article, Analysis of a Social Situation in Modern Zululand, in which he described what superficially looked like the opening of a bridge in Northern Zululand. The events took place in pre-apartheid South Africa. And as such, the opening sentence pointed to the locale as the union of South Africa. The superficial, superficiality of the events is in the main, the fact that the ceremony seems to oscillate between the strict protocols of officialdom and the informalities that emerge with prolonged contact 
between those in power and the people they rule over. For Gluckman, this was the meaning of a social situation. And I quote, a social situation is thus the behavior on some occasion of members of the community as such, analyzed and compared with their behavior on other occasions, so that the analysis reveals the underlying system of relationships between the social structure of the community, the parts of the social structure, the physical environment, and the physiological life of the community's members. End of quote. As might be expected of this approach to culture and society, Gluckman spends most of the article describing who belongs to which community or social structure, and his preference is for distinguishing between Zulu and, and European, even though he admits that all could be called Zululanders, exactly by virtue of daily and continuous contact. This daily contact is evident in the fact that when European and Zulu meet, they seem to always pick up on a conversation that has obviously taken place elsewhere. Were it not for the racial undertones and undertow, this could be called socializing. In choosing to understand this event as a social situation, therefore, Gluckman focused on the fissures and fractures created by the cultural separation of European and Zulu. The schisms within the groups didn't seem to concern him much. Yet, this is not the article's most glaring lacuna. For our purposes, Gluckman's main blind spot was that despite several references to the police, policemen, cattle dipping, sheep theft, warrior dress, equestrian dress, and sartorial performance, Gluckman's anthropological eye glazed over these references as if these were simply the facts or data of the social situation and not the social situation itself. Thus, for, him, for example, his host, Matolan Andwandwe, not only has his attire prepared by a manservant, the outfit is enumerated as, and I quote, he prepared Matolana's attire for state occasions, khaki uniform jacket, riding breeches, boots, and leather gaiters, end of quote. Despite his own ability to name the different parts of the attire and their functions, Gluckman fails to explain the obvious equestrian theme and why it would be worn for state occasions. The second example is when Gluckman indexed a man in a photo with the description, quote, Note man chanting with his stick lifted in left foreground next to policemen is an Induna in the military garb much favored by the Zulu, end of quote. In other words, had Gluckman's anthropological practice included an incisive gaze and study of the symbolism of clothing, then his whole article might have been titled analysis of a sartorial situation in modern Zululand. As with many other studies of chiefship and power, Gluckman simply assumed that the meaning of these dress performances was self-evident self and transparent, and that therefore they required no further explanation. As a consequence, therefore, even though the captions of the photographs used in the article are suffused with sartorial contestation, tensions, and drama, Gluckman presented these images as matter of fact. This is how the Zulu dress for war. This is how the Europeans dress for state functions. This is how the regent dressed for his office. The purpose of this chapter and this webinar is to demonstrate that the assumed matter of factness of clothing is actually a historical fiction, which has colored the manner in which photographs of Zulu policemen are read and interpreted. Even without Gluckman's blind spots, 
it is possible to accuse the disciplines of anthropology and history of having overlooked the policeman as a social situationist. Policing has, with few exceptions, been regarded as a function of the state, even though it is near impossible to define such function. Although it is simple enough to imagine a policeman chasing a pickpocket and define this as the quint quintessence of police work, it is by no means clear why police and military dress would be worn for the opening of a bridge. The police, in other words, have their own optics which they care about, and historians and anthropologists have ignored these aesthetic codes in favor of an assumption of transparency, the photograph as a mere factoid. This assumption extends further. The photograph of a policeman is a factoid of imminent and immanent violence. Armed with, this, with these assumptions, it is logical to gloss over the images of men dressed in military and police uniforms and insignia, and to assume that this is the natural and taken for granted expression of the state's presence and power. It is therefore paradoxical that it was photographers who took advantage of the season that existed between fact and image, politics and performance, optics and function, to create an archive of photographs that in totality works to distance the policeman from the site of state power. The policeman as a social situation is therefore, is about these chasms of image and meaning that photographers imploded by turning the policeman soldier into a photographic subject. As this chapter and webinar will demonstrate, there are multiple hyphens involved in the construction of this archive with policeman soldier being just one of them. Superficially, what fascinated photographers, photographers about Zulu policemen was the ethnic signifier, the efficient and efficacious conversion of a warrior into a useful servant of the state was the underlying logic of the exoticization of Zulu men and their physique. Stopping at this point, however, would be a gross underestimation of the reach of this visual discourse. If it was just about martial races, then the discourse would, be, would, would reach its limits once the theater of war has been abandoned and the swords are turned into plowshares. The native policeman was photographed, whether it was wartime or peacetime. And this implies that the martial part was only a minuscule rationalization. In exploring the multiple visual cues that were added in order to make the Zulu policeman a credible photographic subject, it is pertinent to remember that many of these photographs were not produced by the police or the state. The extemporization of the image was lost when it was fixed by being bathed in hypo, but this should not make us believe that there was an institutional fixing too. Very few of the images discussed in this book were authorized by, state, by the state or its functionaries. In the following discussion then, it will become apparent how the Zulu policeman was both a marginal figure, since he was really give, rarely given credit for his policing work, and a constellation consisting of many sons, since so many photographers treated him as a colonial celebrity. This celebration of the Zulu man as their night watch marshaled already existing stereotypes of black men while also revealing new contours of for how the body could be thought and unthought. To begin with, the Zulu policeman functioned as a ready-made comic figure. While it is tempting to use the word buffoon, which a lot of people normally use to describe um, Zulu policemen, such temptation should be resisted since the, the policeman was not entirely a clown. He was a menacing clown. Behind his back, it may have been acceptable to laugh at the Zulu policeman, but to his face, such laughter would not have been countenanced. As an alternative to buffoonery, 
it is perhaps best to refer to the equally comedic role of the Harlequin. This is firstly because of the Harlequin's role as a stock character. And secondly, because in the original Italian iteration, the Harlequin not only had a master, but he carried a magic bat or wand. Since the Zulu policeman was not only a servant, but he also carried a nobkiri, it seems more apt to refer to his comic photographic avatars as those of a Harlequin. In the following definition, it is pertinent to note that costumes and costuming are central to the creation of comic characters. In the case of the Zulu policeman, it is the fact that the uniform becomes a costume since no two uniforms ever seemed to look exactly alike. The capricious nature of the Zulu policeman look means that even when we, knew, we know little about the photographic genre, we sense an element of mirth in the unlimited uniform combination. In the companion to theater and performance, the character of the Harlequin is defined in the following terms. The Harlequin was always undertaking intrigues for his master and getting into scrapes. By the second half of the 17th century, his costume consisted of patches of blue, red and green triangles joined with yellow braid later replaced by a diamond-shaped lozenge. His forehead was lined with wrinkles and tiny holes represented his eyes. He often commented on topical events and parodied the serious drama. In English pantomime, he was a silent character, a dancer and tumbler, leaping through traps to evade pantaloon and clown and empowered by a magic bat. End of quote from the companion to theater and performance. The centrality of costuming to the photographic imaginary of the Zulu policeman means that we have to interrogate the many ways in which writers such as Max Gluckman have elided the spect spectacularity of this visual display. This, however, is merely a starting point since it is not enough to point to the paucity of the literature. One has to refer to the plenitude offered by the visual archive of these fighting men in their garb. In the scholarly literature on the history of photography in South Africa, the name of the government ethnologist, Nicholas Jacobus van Wamelo, is hardly ever mentioned. Yet van Wamelo was an avid photographer. It is to his camera that we owe the provenance of two images of Zulu policemen that symbolized the Harlequinesque uniform that was sometimes worn by these men. As the above definition of a Harlequin emphasizes, the Harlequin was a creature of intrigue. And when this is applied to the Zulu policemen or night watchmen, we know from previous chapters that this intrigue often involved dressing and undressing in order to prove that they were not concealing weapons and or in order to prove that they were not um, um, or convince their allies of their loyalty or to turn coat. Peculiarly, Van Wormelen's images are not dated. This may be explained by the fact that his official role as chief ethno ethnologist in South Africa's Native Affairs Department was focused mainly on the tribes of the then Transvaal. He produced substantial manuscripts on the Transvaal Debele while also co-authoring several volumes on the Venda or the Vavenda. From this vantage point, the Zulu were therefore an, an addendum, albeit a revealing one. Relying on his list of publications, which range from 1933 to 1938 to 1941, we can safely assume that most of the, the photographs that I'm about to show you were taken between the 1930s and the 1950s. It is therefore already plain and unproblematic to state that as late as the 1930s, when the history of Matiwane, which is one of Van Wormelo's books was published, the Zulu policeman was still and continued to be a compelling photographic subject. The persistence of the genre could be attributed to many factors. The reluctance of the imperial and colonial governments to invest in policing for Africans, the lack of imagination about what would work as a uniform in the colonial environment and whether 
the durability of worsted wool and other quote unquote English manufacture, the idiosyncratic choices made by individual policemen as to their appearances, or the secularity of the careers that were available to Zulu men. All these reasons are valid, but they are not sufficient for explaining how two very different individuals can, can wear exactly the same type of attire while having no discernible physical or social link tying them together. The young Zulu girl with man photograph, which is in front of you right now, functions as a perfect visual decoy since the title of the photograph would mislead a casual observer. Van Wormelo evidently focused the eye of the camera on the young girl. Her prepubescent beauty and naivety was abundantly exp expressed by her half-closed eyes and her long arms that are rigidly framing her torso. The gloss on her face, neck, and upper torso testified to her nascent appreciation of her body's cosmetic needs and possibilities, while also making her as uh, make it, marking her as alluringly gammon. We can guess that this is what attracted Van Wormelo to her. Yet it is the man standing to her right who dominates the photograph. In his own rigid stance, he seems to be imitating the young girl or the young girl was imitating him. Since he was not the subject of the photograph, his body is dissected almost in half by the end of the frame. For the occasion for which he didn't seem to be the invited guest, he wore leather, traditional leather sandals, izimbadada, an ibeshu, a tasseled leather kilt, a short light colored undershirt, a military jacket decorated with triple chevrons on the left sleeve, a copious amount of beaded jewelry around his neck, and to finish his look, he held a pipe in his mouth. And just above his lips, one can also detect the presence of earplugs. Since both the night watchman and his young charge are wearing bead and brass jewelry, this doesn't seem to deserve much analysis. These are the insignia that made them tribal subjects in the understanding of an ethnologist of Van Wormelo's training. The contrast between them lies in the fact that the one subject is an adult and the other a child. And yet the jouissance of the image relies on the costume of the adult night watchman. Here, I prefer the term night watchman exactly because Van Wormelo didn't describe this Cisura figure as a policeman, despite the fact that he is dressed in the semblance of a uniform. In his eagerness to find an exotic picanine, Van Wormelo, like his counterpart Gluckman, pointed the camera in such a way that the night watchman was marginalia. As with Gluckman, the sense that one gets is that the presence of the man in uniform was regarded as unremarkable. He did not signify difference in the way that the girl did. He was not the ethnic other in the way that the young girl's body symbolically represented otherness. As with Gluckman, the illusion becomes the social situation. How is it possible that Van Wormelo did not think it was remarkable to see a grown man in a crop singlet and a military jacket. Zulu policemen on, on patrol amplifies our dizzying sense of asynchronism by presenting yet another adult male dressed in a tassel kilt and military jacket. In contrast to the intrusive policemen of the first photograph, Zulu policemen on patrol is comfortably poised and centered in the frame. There are no excisions to his uniform. From the manner in which the policeman took his stance with his feet slightly turned out, outwards, it is clear that he was posing and this was therefore no spontaneous snap in the way that the young uh, girl's photograph seems to be set up. The squint of the policeman's eyes and the 12 o'clock shadow behind him suggest that the photograph was taken in the noonday sun under intense heat. And this is evident in most of Van Wormelo's photographs. He seemed to like to photograph black people in intense heat. So everyone is sweating in the photograph. It is therefore jarring to notice that the policeman is not only wearing a jacket, but he had also draped a heavy military coat um, over his left arm. As with the previous policeman, 
he also wore traditional sandals and a light colored undershirt. However, in contrast to the previous policeman, this night watchman was also carrying weapons, a stick and a nobkiri in the left hand and a spear in the right. If he was on patrol, then this was an ineffective way to prepare to catch or surprise offenders since he basically has no free hand. The involvement of the whole body in this pose was completed by the slouch hat, which permitted not only the capture of his facial expression, but also reinforced the military elements of his uniform. The long jacket on his body was held together by a clasped belt and the handkerchief that was tucked into the belt functions as a confirmation that he probably needed to mop his brow several times during the day. As a complete ensemble, this watchman's uniform vacillates between benign ridicule and bone chilling menace. This is because of what we already know about the damage that can be inflicted by the blow of a nobkiri. And here I'm referring to several mil uh, medical reports in South Africa of um, people who had been injured in faction fights and how it is that you can basically suffer from meningitis from being hit with a, with a, knob, with a knob theory. And also the lingering danger of being entrapped in the many colonial machinations that depended on the physical prowess of the night watchman. Taken together, these two images shot by Van Wormelo offer to the viewer a kind of short-lived relief at the drollness of the garments worn by the night watchmen. Yet it also becomes simultaneously apparent that hidden behind these hodgepodge uniforms is a power which even the photographer missed, especially in the first, in the first image since Van Wormelo doesn't identify the watchman. The accidental nature of young Zulu girl with, with man casts a shadow over our immediate comprehension of why such uniforms would have been chosen for African men in military and police service. And again, as with Gluckman, Van Wormelo doesn't seem to have concerned himself with understanding the eminence grease that functioned in the background to make such get-ups effective as uniforms and, signifier of policing, and signifiers of policing and war work. In this regard, the Harlequin metaphor underscores the patchwork nature of police and war work, while also as stated above, unearthing the duck underbelly of such work through foregrounding the masked nature of the policeman's visage, visage and photogenic ease. The two, the two photographs in Van, Van Wormelo's archive can also be read as avatars of fantastical policemen and watchmen who um, um, existed in the imagination of artists. It seems peculiar that South Africa has such an illustrious history of what J.M. Coutier called white writing, and yet writing about policing or policemen is scant. The two exceptions, two books, two novels, The Native Commissioner and The Book of War, prove the rule since they haven't received the kind of literary criticism, criticism that, for example, protest literature has received. And here I'm going to change a little bit of tag and start just showing you the images. So the first image that is a kind of literary image of, of the Zulu policeman is this um, cartoon that was uh, drawn by um, uh, William Schroeder, who is credited actually as having been South, Af South Africa's first professional cartoonist. And this image, according to the um, signature at the bottom of the image was made in 1884. And as you can see, it, um, exactly as the previous image, um, a sort of Zulu man, uh, leather uh, tassel, kilt, shield. And then interestingly enough, as a cartoonist, he has chosen to use the nokiri um, in a kind of exaggerated size, but also he has mixed the nokiri with the quill. And so he uses this almost as a way of saying that as a cartoonist, he was quite combative. But it is interesting that basically as a white man, he had chosen um, as a, or as a white cartoonist, he had chosen this Zulu policeman as a symbol. And again, if you want to um, ask me why do I think that this is a Zulu person, you only have to look at things like the earplugs and the shape of the shield, etc. So these are all signifiers of, of, Zulu, of, of Zulu-ness, which William Schroeder had picked um, 
to um, establish um, this as a as a, as an image of what a cartoonist in colonial South Africa should be doing. Uh, again, if you want to read the whole paper, I can I can send it to you if you want to know more about William Schroeder's um, biography. Now, William Schroeder can be credited as having been the first elite uh, or educated South African to basically poke fun um, at the Zulu policeman as a figure of, of state power. The other person who did the same thing was Saul Blakey, who almost a, uh, a decade or two decades later wrote an entire article in which he described the Zulu policeman as large as to proportion, a buffoon, and basically the antithesis of, of um, educated Africans. So part of what the book is about is attempting to understand why it was educated Africans who often objected to the presence of black men in police uniforms and exactly that they are the ones who often use this language of buffoonery and as I say this understanding that the Zulu policeman was distinguished by this by his huge size. Um, ironically the policeman in South Africa also established a magazine uh, in 1907 and this is all pre-union so this is still when South Africa was a constellation of uh, republics and colonies. And the name that they chose for this magazine was Nongai. And Nongai is the Zulu word for a night watchman. So this is why my language of talking about these men um, oscillates between calling them policemen, soldiers, and then night watchmen. Um, and I'm aware that there's a, I think a Netflix series called Watchmen. This has nothing to do with it. Nongai has always meant night watchmen in Zulu. So it's not as if I got it from the Netflix Series, whatever it's called. Um, and the Nongai remains called the Nongai, and most white South Africans call it Nongkwai. So a lot of former policemen come to my talks and then they come to me and they say, but it's called Nongkwai. And I'm like, no, it's Nongai. Um, it remained with this name until 1979 when it was changed to Seva Mus, which is part of the motto of the South African police, police service, which is Latin basically for, for service. So in the, the whole argument that I present is the idea that white policemen essentially borrowed from Zulu men the name Night Watchmen, but excluded them actually from this magazine because this magazine was largely dedicated to the lifestyles of white policemen. It, and it was not about policing. It was about family life and putting your children in police uniforms and picking zebras as mascots for police stations. So there's like dozens of photographs where poli white policemen are posing with ostriches and zebras and antelopes and all sorts of, so it was like a lifestyle magazine for policemen essentially. Until obviously the security issues in South Africa took over and turned it into a security studies magazine. Um, and in 1921, this was one of the images. So one of the concepts that I'm sort of picking up from this magazine is the concept of the Black Watch. And in 1921, this is the image that was published in this magazine, Nongai, that showed in some ways what white policemen thought about their black colleagues. And as you can see, it, it borrows from exactly this discourse of the Zulu man as a buffoon, as oversized and, 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 and grotesque in that way, frightening, but still um, a kind of um, grotesque figure. But this is beyond the period that I'm working on. So what I'm trying to do is to trace back the concept of the Black Watch. And for those of you who know um, the history of the military or the police, you, also, you would also know that the Black Watch is a Scottish regiment that wears a particular um, uh, pattern, uh, which is also called a Black Watch. So a Black Watch is also a fabric, essentially a Scotch, fabric that you can buy, but it refers to the Scottish uh, regiment. So it's kind of ethnic joke on top of another ethnic ethnic joke. So one of the um, issues that I'm concerned with in, in the book is the history of military tribunals in which African chiefs were essentially deposed from their position simply because they, they contested the colonial government in one way or another. And most of these depositions were done using a military tribunal. So in this instance, I just stumbled when I was at the British Museum looking for photographs of 
um, Zulu policemen. So I should also emphasize that this has not been the easiest of projects because there isn't a single archive. So within South Africa, because of the history of republics and colonies, there's essentially like six, seven different military archives in South Africa, six, seven different um, uh, police archives, six, seven different archives of what happened during the Boer War. And you sort of had to go and look at all of them. Um, so I was at the British Museum looking for these photographs of Zulu policemen when I stumbled upon these two images that I'm about to talk about. And what is peculiar about these two images is that the names of the people in the images are not listed. Um, and if you know anything about the history of South Africa, you will know that this person over here um, is, looks, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty positive that it's John Dube, who was one of the founders of the African National Congress. So it makes, it's very peculiar that he's called Natal, or he's part of a photograph that's labeled as Natal Chief. And I've never seen this photograph, and I've asked several people who've worked on John Dube, whether this is John Dube, none of them can affirm. But I, from just looking at him, I'm definitely sure that it's him. So that's what intrigued me about the photograph. But also you can see that nearly every second man here is wearing medals. And then most of them are also wearing um, the traditional Zulu insignia of manhood, which is this Iskoko. But the figure that I want you to focus on is this elderly man here in this white uniform. Um, and I'll come back to it in a moment. Um, when you first look at it, it looks like the, uni the, the uniform that was called the kitchen suit in South Africa. Because again, what most people don't realize is that the first domestic workers in South Africa were actually Zulu men. And I'll explain in a moment why. Um, so this man is dressed in what looks like a uniform that was worn by domestic, uh, male domestic workers in South Africa. But actually, as you'll see in a moment, it's not. The second image from exactly the same box is labeled as Zulu Chief 1906. So this already tells you that this was, these photographs were probably taken during the Babata Rebellion. This is the main poll tax or anti-poll tax rebellion by the Zulu Chief Babata. And from the literature, the rebellion is basically described as Babata, a traditionalist uh, revolt against the colonial state and these Zulu men who are Natal chiefs and Christian converts help the colonial government fight the rebellion. So these are the men who would have been the traitors and these are the men who would have been for Bambata's former allies. But if, as you can see, there's no real difference between the, the two photographs. In this photograph as well, you get Zulu men who are wearing medals, which suggest that they fought for the British or the Boers. Um, they are also wearing head rings and some of them are wearing this uh, cross sash here of wooden beads, which in Zulu is called Iziku. Now, if there are any Zulu listeners uh, who are listening, many Zulu people now imagine that Iziku means a degree that you get from a university, but that's not what the word originally meant. It meant beads that you were given by the Zulu king for bravery in war. And so you'll see uh, there's at least two people here who are wearing these sashes of beads. And so going back to that white uniform that that elderly man is working, this photograph calls these men police court messengers. And they are all dressed in this white uniform, which, and this um, braiding or uh, ribbon is normally red in color. Um, so these were probably also red in color. And as you can see from the age range, the age range ranges from uh, elderly to very young. And so this gives you a sense of the fact that that white uniform wasn't just for domestic workers. If a magistrate wanted to send bad news to you, which was that you had overstepped your, your position as a chief, these are the men who would have come to deliver the bad news. So one of the jokes that I make is that the magistrates were delivered, delivering bad news uh, in, with men dressed in white. Now, this is another intriguing photograph, which comes from a totally different archive and is simply labeled as Zulu personages. Now, from what we know about the Babata Rebellion and the photographs of the Babata Rebellion, this is probably another photograph of one of the personages who had overstepped what the boundaries set for him by the colonial government. 
And you can see in this photograph, as with the Max Gluckman story, there's an equestrian theme. So many of the men here are wearing riding boots, they are wearing breeches, and then again, the repeated theme of medals, 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 and then medals, and then the traditional Zulu uh, mark of masculinity. But this photograph doesn't become remarkable, and also horse whips. This photograph doesn't come, become remarkable until you see its body double, exactly the same people sitting almost in exactly the same position with just a few additions. The three white men who are possibly lawyers, then these two Zulu women who are sitting here, um, and they are dressed in what I call a full traditional style. Um, this is not exactly a traditional style, but as I say to the sort of casual observer, they look like they are traditional because they are wearing togas and shawls. And we can, again, we can talk about that later. But the most intriguing figure is the Zulu policeman who is standing here with his arms folded, suggesting he didn't want to be in the photograph. But he's also wearing this metal um, badge on his um, left arm. And many historians have written about these metal ba uh, badges as if they only became prominent um, when um, the, the mining companies in South Africa employed black men as boss boys, referring back to that epigraph. So this is the image that most people know, which was taken by David, um, David Goldblatt. And as you can see, there's a metal badge here and it clearly says boss boy on the, and this was an image that was taken in 1966. So most people assume that it was the mines who invented this metal badge and imposed it on Africans. But actually, as you can see from that image of that policeman, the mines had nothing to do with it. They were copying from the military and the police. And then the next um, figure of the Zulu policeman that I look at is what I call the Zulu policeman as a bow, as a dandy. And this is a theme that I've um, carried throughout the book and it's an argument about why it is that these policemen would pose for photographs wearing copious amounts of jewelry, um, also a kind of emulation of the sort of effeminate or feminine um, jewelry. Now, this photograph comes from the Barnett collection at the Cullen Library. And this idea that the Zulu policeman was a kind of sweetheart to a very traditional looking woman was a kind of almost photographer's joke because several of these photographs sort of exist. But part of what the photograph conceals is actually the, the, the argument that I made when I showed you the men in the white uniform, which is that Zulu men and black men were actually the only people who were allowed to work. Um, African women uh, were assumed under customary law to be perpetual minors. And so because they were minors, they could never get a job. They could never sign a contract. Um, and so colonial government essentially used customary law to stop African women from getting jobs. And so this photograph is a kind of representation of that. The man works and the woman has to sit at home titivating herself and wearing loads of jewelry. But then obviously the, the, the inversion here is that the men also ended up wearing a lot of jewelry. And again, to emphasize, this was prohibited in the rule. I mean, I didn't show you all of that, but if you read the police uniform rule, no jewelry was allowed. So these men were essentially wearing jewelry um, against the roof. Um, so this is the Zulu policeman as a dandy or as a, as a beau um, with his sweetheart. Now the theme, interestingly enough, is also repeated across other uh, forms of work that Zulu men were in. So again, going back to the, uni the white uniform that uh, uh, Zulu men had to wear for domestic work. And in this photograph, again, you can see that the jewelry that the two are wearing is sort of the same. So this is one of the mistakes that people make when they study African beadwork. They assume that this is um, a kind of ethnic signifier, but actually these were styles of jewelry in which people would just pick particular color combinations or particular um, ways of beading. And then they would repeat that until it, came, it went out of fashion essentially. So these two are also wearing similar style jewelry which suggests that they had some kind of relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean that, as the caption says, Zulu lovers. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were lovers. But what makes the image what it is, is the fact that they both have materials draped around their arms. 
But the grimace on the young man's face also probably tells you that he didn't want to be in, in this picture or at least in this pose. And again, I write about the fact that the photographer created a kind of outdoor studio by creating the screen, which was also a very popular theme in photographing Zulu police. Um, they would just set up these outdoor studios. And then the other theme that I move to before I run out of time is the theme of doubles, um, in which you basically see the same people more than once and your memory has to sort of help you out. So this is the first image. This was an image that was a postcard, Native Police Durban 1909. And then exactly the same people um, <laughs> with one missing. So this young man is in the previous image. This man is in the previous image. This man is in the previous image. Now, the argument that I make is that the photographer seemed to have been intrigued by the way that the young man is wearing this, his helmet. So when I first initially saw this image, I thought this, this young man was underage. I thought there's no way that this person is an adult. He looks a bit too young to be a policeman until I saw this image. And then I just had to verify using the size of his hand to say he's possibly an adult. Um, so again, the question becomes, why does one image become a postcard and the other image simply gets lost in the, in the archive? And then the last sort of doubling is this image, which again, the first image I found was this one in the Barnett collection. It uh, seems unproblematic for Zulu men, all wearing jewelry, all posing for a photograph, until you see the next one, which is exactly the same character, these same Zulu policemen, and then the inclusion of the woman in the middle. So again, as you've seen, there's a kind of developing theme where Zulu women are sort of used as a kind of ethnic curios in the photographing of the Zulu, uh, Zulu policemen. The woman is included to emphasize that she is not part of the labor market, but at the same time to also emphasize the fact that these men are Zulu, because otherwise they would just look like men anywhere in the world. And again, exactly the same jewelry. So the photograph was probably taken on exactly the same day by exactly the same photographers. And the Zulu woman just has to, had to be called sort of from off stage, like, oh, come in now. It's your time to be in the, in the photograph. So I'll stop there uh, because I'm going to run out of time. But the basic argument, as I said, is really about tracing why it is that these uniforms have so many meanings that so many times they are not even the same uniform, but also the fact that this, the bodies of these men were repeatedly used to emphasize particular types of physique. So I call it the Robocop physique, where the colonial government was more than happy to have men who didn't seem to need to eat, men who didn't seem to need to be clothed. And there are loads and loads of debates in the, in the written archive about how expensive it is to clothe policemen and how much, how long a uniform is meant to last. So the colonial fantasy was actually to give them as little as possible whether it was food or clothing. And then the fantasy was that they were supposed to do police work just using these sticks that are called not curious. And as you can see, they never, there are very few of the photographs where they are carrying guns. So there was no violence visible, but the violence was implied in them carrying the not curious. So I'll stop there and open for questions and, and discussion. I hope I'm, I'm on time. I think I'm on time. Yes, you are very much on time and we thank you for that and also for that um, really excellent talk and just um, really amazing photographs to look at during the talk as well. Um, so the, the floor um, as it is, is is now open for questions and comments. Again, there are two ways you can post something in the Q&A or you can um, raise your hand and we'll unmute you and um, if you're willing to do that, that would be great. So um, yeah, the floor is open. Okay, um, Lindsay Arisman, you should be able to talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. This was an incredible talk, so interesting. Um, I, I'm fascinated by what you mentioned in the beginning of the talk that all of these um, photographs were taken, they weren't sponsored or authorized by the these sort of institutions. Um, so our photographers are just taking them on their own, but I'm wondering who is their imagined audience? Like where, where are these photographs circulating? 
Um, I know they're in these different museums and archives now, but at the time, I mean, what, yeah, who was the audience of, of these photographs? Um, do I answer immediately or do I wait for several questions? You can go ahead and answer. Okay, so the most intriguing discovery was the fact that quite a lot of these photographs, like all sort of cut the visite, would end up in people's family albums. So I'll tell you the little story of being in the National Library in Cape Town and sort of finding my little slip to request an item. And um, the, 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 uh, the porter brings back this humongous family album and gives me a pair of gloves. And then I say, but where's my policeman? And he points at the album, he says, your policeman is in there. And so they, there were these humongous family albums where you would page and then there would be just all these African men who'd been inserted um, into the family album next to children in, in strollers and family picnics and the family on the, on the Durban beachfront or whatever. And then in the middle would be the Zulu policeman. So, I'm using the term intimate colonialism to talk about exactly the way in which, as I say, the Zulu policeman became a kind of colonial celebrity in which people were more than happy um, to have the photograph of a policeman in their, in their family album. The other part of it is that white policemen seem to have wanted, even back then, to sort of um, make the argument uh, visually, that they were in charge of a black police corps. So in this photograph that is at the beginning of the, of the presentation, you will see that this white policeman is holding a kind of miniature version of a nobkiri. So many of them would hold fly whisks and nobkiris while they were taking these photographs. So the photographs also functioned as a way for affirming white policemen's identities as sort of senior police in a native in a native core. So that was the other function of the, of, the, of the photograph. And then the other one, as I mentioned, is this sort of, I'm not sure why this was funny in the 19th century, but policemen seem to like using animals as mascots. So there are so many police photographs in Nongai, the police magazine, where these like 20 policemen would pose with an ostrich and they'd say like something really like Leonard the ostrich he comes into the office every day or something. You know, it would be like a caption like that. And I'd be like, what is so funny about this? And it was also about um, a, a kind of demonstration, as I say, of this, what seemed to be an inexhaustible physique of, of Zulu men. There seemed to have just been an obsession with sort of finding or making images that showed um, Zulu policemen as these sort of, um, as I say, robo robocops, inexhaustible, no need to feed them, no need to even give them a good uniform. So you'll see in, in many of the photographs, you see a policeman wearing gaiters, but he's not wearing shoes, which suggests that he was riding a horse with no boots, which is actually very difficult. It can be done, but it's quite difficult because your foot has to stay in the stirrup. Um, this is the whole function. So if any of you like fashion, this is the whole function of the, of the heel in a boot, in a police boot, is to keep your foot in the stirrup. So if you're riding barefoot, you are essentially just using your own heel to remain in the horse. And they, they were doing that. Um, and so this was the colonial fantasy. But as I say, for many of the white policemen, it was about demonstrating the fact that they were the leaders of a, of a, native, of a native corps. And then obviously there was the commercial um, aspect these photographs were sold. So I use a chapter on photographs of Sejuayo, the Zulu king. So when the British captured Sejuayo in 1879, all these adverts suddenly appeared in newspapers advertising photographs of Sejuayo and how much they cost. And from 1879 onwards, there was just this frenzy of sort of sale of Zulu photographs. Everyone would say, and they would all repeat the same phrase, we want to see what our enemy looks like. So there's an element of that too, in which these photographs function as a sort of signifier of the kind of, we wanna see who these people who beat the British are. And these photographs then circulated around the world as a sort of marker of, of, Zulu, of Zulu prowess. And as I said in the conversation about the doubles, there's also a lot of fakes 
but we're not gonna talk about the fakes now. So there's loads of policemen photographs of people who were not policemen, who were just posed in a, in a studio. Thank you. Next question or comment. While people are gathering their thoughts, I'll pose a follow-up question to, to Lindsay's and thinking about um, audiences and the argument you were making, particularly at the end of your talk, um, when I think you you said something like the bodies of these men were utilized in certain ways, and you, re you reiterated some of that now. Um, I'm wondering if there's a way to or to think about the ways in which, and, and to think about the fakes in this context too, I would like to hear about the fakes, but to think about the ways in which these photographs, or even if people, even if um, the, the, um, the, the Zulu men in these photographs didn't actually have copies of them ever, to imagine ways in which they might have circulated and been received within Zulu communities, and why it is that someone would want to dress up um, in, as a fake policeman and have his photograph taken um, what he, you know, what what would motivate that from the perspective of um, not where the photographs ended up, but from the perspective of his community. Okay, that's a an intriguing question. So, um, my grand when I showed my grandmother these photographs um, and asked her, so my grandmother was in her nineties already. My grandmother was born in nineteen twenty four. So she would have seen um, several eras of policing in South Africa from the colonial period to the apartheid era and then to the apartheid era. Um, so the first thing that she told me, which totally surprised me, she said every household had a military coat behind the door. And the whole point was to use it in inclement weather to go and get coal or, or firewood outside. She said, you just throw it over your head and run outside in the rain and get the coal and then come back. Um, and that was called it as a soldier, which literally means a soldier's jacket. So there was a kind of economy of military wear that um, was created by the presence of the military. So there are several descriptions of people just dressing in police, including the soldiers and policemen themselves, but they would dress up in decommissioned uniforms, which were being sold secondhand. So they would parade in the camp. So all these white officers are describing these Fengu or Zulu men sewing stripes onto their pants, parading in the camp on a Saturday or a Sunday. And then the minute that there's an actual war, they take off that whole uniform and then just put on a plain white shirt and then go out and fight. And so this is one, was one of the fascinating discoveries was the fact that there was this whole sort of sec uh, uh, market for secondhand military uniforms where just you could meet somebody on the street and they'd be dressed in a jacket with epaulets. Um, and these were being imported into South Africa in quite huge numbers. Um, and interestingly now, Shula Marx in about 1977 or 1979 published an article on the gun frontier. And she actually showed that guns preceded colonialism in South Africa, in the sense that there were guns that were coming into South Africa from outside decommissioned guns that would just spread across South Africa long before um, Africans even came into contact with the colonial state itself. So gunpowder and guns were also very common. And as I say, when the British would be fighting the frontier wars, they would write and say, these guys have showed up on the frontier with Wesley Richards and we don't even know where they got them from, but they just have showed up with their own guns. And so Africans were willing to spend an inordinate amount of money purchasing decommissioned uniforms, purchasing guns, and per literally just wearing them as sort of Sunday best. So this is one of the things I say about what Max Gluckman missed was the fact that this was not mere clothing. It had become a kind of dress style or a dress um, um, sense, a kind of swagger. So the term swagger is used a lot. The term, I could use the term drip. So in Zulu, if you are well-dressed, people say we are gone, that you are dripping. And now it's kind of like a, coll a colloquial term or a slang term for being dressed well. So these men were wearing 
police uniforms and military uniforms as a form of drip, as a form of swagger. And as I say, they were not actually using their uniforms for fighting because they were quite obviously uncomfortable because these were uh, like worsted wool. Um, and so there's a whole chapter dedicated to that period in the Cape Colony where mixed race men, the people who then became the colored community in South Africa, were doing exactly the same thing. And in that case, they would often kill the British and then take their military clothes. And the, the British would sort of describe how these mixed race men would show up to negotiate peace and then they'd all be wearing sappers coats. And they'd be like, yeah, we're here to negotiate peace. But you obviously know that in order to negotiate peace, they've killed people from your side because they're wearing the jackets. So it's kind of like a very bizarre sort of negotiating tactic to sort of wear a military jacket as well. So I have a whole chapter dedicated to just that as a negotiating tactic. So I hope I, I'm answering your question. Yeah. So there were various levels from that military coat hanging behind the door to people using military clothing as a negotiating tactic in their conversation with the British. Fascinating. Okay, any other questions, comments? Um, Erica, if we, um, you should be able to speak now. Hi, Clonipa, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think this idea of the sartorial sort of um, misreading that you, you or this, this, this opportunity to read into a society through the clothing is such an in incredible um, observation that you're bringing up. And I think it, it it offers such an opportunity to rethink the way in which history is written because clothing and particularly yeah, you're referring also to the way in some ways a kind of mirth or a kind of irony that comes in through clothing but it's the it's the ability to embody clothing and and insert different kinds of meaning mechanisms in that so I find it such a fascinating um, topic that you you exploring here, um, and the distinction between wearing the uniform as as was originally intended, and then inserting other kinds of bodies into the uniform to kind of almost revert that meaning or or, or disrupt that meaning, and your observation of the, um, the the histories of those writings that that completely missed those opportunities of reading what was happening and and I suppose that's part of your work where you able to insert new kinds of meanings through through the dress narrative so I, I, I find that really really interesting and 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 so may, maybe the question is also just this this incredible sort of um, shift between um, employ and um, and power um, that is encoded in, in, in the uniform. So it isn't really a question as much, but really an appreciation that, that, that we're able to think about history differently by looking more closely at the dress practices. So thank you so much for that. Yeah. Um, Erica, thank you so much for your comment. Yes, I mean, I, you know, I'm using, there's a quote by Roland Barth in, in, in um, uh, the fashion system, I think, um, where he talks about how it is that actually sociologists and historians have missed the opportunity to write about dress. And he says dressing is part of the axiological order um, in which he's basically arguing that the mores, you can almost measure the mores and values of a society by looking at what, what, what people were wearing. Um, and I don't know if any of you um, remember the, what was that British art historian, Berger? He has a whole analysis of a photograph of Italian peasants wearing suits and how it is that you can tell from the fit of the suit that they are peasants, that they are not um, of high status. 
So that's also part of the, of the argument that I'm trying to make is that people have largely assumed that dress is aristocratic. So aristocrats get dressed, poor people just wear clothes. And so this is one of the things that I'm trying to destabilize because I say many of these men were literally taking their whole paycheck and buying decommissioned military uniforms just so they could parade around the camp and look and dress for the jobs that they knew they could never have because the jobs were almost by definition for white officers. So in some ways they were demonstrating the fact that they were better than the white officers just by dressing for the past. And as I say, when you read the descriptions, like I've had to find out what a, what a Wesley Richards is. And it's like an ornate rifle that is embossed in silver. And Wesley Richards still makes guns. They make hunting guns, they make... So, I mean, I'm sitting there on websites looking at thinking, what was the Kosa man or a Zulu man doing with a silver embossed rifle? Um, in, in colonial South Africa, but they, you know, these men were willing, were willing to, to do that. So yeah, there's multiple levels of irony. And I think one of them is exactly that it destabilizes our assumption that poor people just wear clothes, only rich people get dressed. Is there another question? Can I follow up on that maybe with one more question, <laughs> if you're if you're willing? Um, because it's sort of a methodological one, but it, it relates to also the way in which you analyze photographs. And um, so it is interesting to me, like you're 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 able to read many layers into these photographs, right? Including and many sort of emotions and and sort of someone with um, an untrained eye, like me, for instance. I wouldn't be able to recognize those things in these photographs that you are recognizing that then and the arguments that you've made are based on your analysis of these photographs. So I am wondering how it is you go about doing this kind of work. So you find one of these photographs or a set of these photographs in an archive or a family album or somewhere. And then what do you, what do you do? Is, is it because um, you're familiar with some of the stress from reading other things or from your personal life or from talking to your grandmother? Do you go and then recreate the context from other kinds of archival sources? Um, how do you go about doing this work? And this, is, this question might reflect my own sort of ignorance and how it is you use photographs as sources to make historical arguments rather than just as kind of reflections of things that you already know basically from other sources. Thanks, Neil, for that. Um, whew, this project started off as a hunch. <laughs> um, it is based on, uh, so if any of you have read my first book on Mike Mafuze. So in Mike Mafuze, there's a story of a messenger who gets sent exactly to deliver bad news to a chief that the um, um, Secretary for Native Affairs is coming for him, Theophilus Shepton, that you've done something wrong and Theophilus Shifton is coming for you. Now, before he can even talk, he claims that Langalibalele's people stripped him of his coat and his waistcoat and his clothing. And the entire case of deposing Langalibalele then revolved around whether or not this messenger was stripped. Now, when I read that, it totally fascinated me. Like, how is it that you can lose an entire chiefdom based on the evidence of a messenger who says that they were stripped of their clothing. What does this actually mean? Why did the colonial state obsess about the fact that this messenger had been supposedly stripped? And why did the Zulu people obsess about stripping him if they did? So that was the first hunch. I was like, I have to find the link. You know, when in English they say, if it bleeds, it leaves. So that's how I started with, if it bleeds, it leads. So I started with that Maoisa story of him being stripped uh, for delivering a message that Langalibalele was about to be deposed as a chief by the Secretary for Native Affairs. And then when I went to the archives to look, I found Sergeant X. The first photograph was, that I found was exactly this photograph that was in a family album. And when I saw the fact that Sergeant X was in the studio, that he was carrying a nobkiri, that he was dressed in a very simple uniform, but there was just something there. He was wearing jewelry. I thought, 
did these men wear jewelry for fun? Is this like a Doug and Cronin thing where there's a props locker and the photographer just take out, takes out the props and says, here, dress like this because you're a Zulu. So then I then took Sergeant X as my first photograph. And then I started looking for other ones. Now, the main problem with any the, in this project is you have to look at literally hundreds of these photographs before you can even make one argument because you have to be pretty sure before you make the argument that you've seen at least 20 versions of the same thing or 15 versions of the same thing. Now, the problem is data management is that eventually you sort of lose track of the photographs and you think to yourself, oh, no, this photograph is from the National Library. And then you are writing an article and you're like, but where is that photograph of the rickshaw puller who's wearing a policeman's uniform? And it just starts being confusing. So the first thing to do is to have a proper data management system. Um, so I eventually ended up hiring actually a research assistant who would go and look for many of these photos. I just gave her what she should be looking for. I said, it doesn't matter how tattered the uniform is, military jackets, guns, medals. Or, and so she unearthed a whole treasure trove from Museum Africa, from um, the, the Johannesburg Public Library, et cetera, et cetera. So then I combined, and this is where the project started to come together because many of the photographs that I had collected turned out to have body doubles in all the other archives. So then you start to see how it is that even the archive is unstable because the same photograph can exist in different archives under different collections and under different names. So that has also become part of the project and um, that the archive of these photographs actually is quite unstable. There's no, this is why I call it a historical fiction because when you see one photograph, you think you know what you're looking at. And then when you see it's body double, you're like, oh, oh, this is not what this photograph is about. This photograph is a totally different story. So I, I make a joke again in the paper. I say same personages, different argument when you look at the two different photographs side by side, like that photograph of the four policemen. And then when the woman is inserted in the photograph, you're suddenly like, okay, so you mean she was just standing there while the first photograph was being taken. And then she was like, now you can come in. And just to give you a sense of why this is very important, Sechuayo actually refused to be uh, photographed with his wife. And the photographers kept on saying, come on, you must stand here with your harem. And you'd be like, no, I don't want my wife. And he eventually told one of the photographers, he says, take the photo that you've taken of me and put it in the photograph with my wife. So he was like, Photoshop me into the, into the image. And so there was, there was almost like a, an element of Photoshop in many of these, of, these, um, of these photographs where the photographers were sort of intimating at the fact that they want a soft touch, a feminine touch to this hard edge of the Zulu warrior. But the only way they could get it was just by bringing some random woman, just putting her in the middle of the photographs and then saying Zulu lovers or whatever it is. And so this is exactly one of the, the difficulties is the first thing you have to amass like a huge number of these photographs, look at them over and over again. And then the arguments start to gel the more that you get. Um, like for example, somebody recently went to the Durban Local History Museum. And so many of the photographs that had been turned into postcards suddenly materialized. And it also comes with copyright issues because now if you have three photographs that are of the same person, but are of different things, like one photograph is tinted, one photograph is not, who do you ask for permission? Which archive do you go to and say, this is your photograph, can I, can I use it? Because now you essentially have three people, three different archives who have claim on the, on the photograph. Um, so I have to resolve that issue, issue two too. <laughs> Thank you. Well, unless there's another question or comment, um, I'm just going to thank you, Kunipa, for it's such a fascinating talk. It was so fun to listen to. I really look forward to reading the book and the other work coming out of this project. And again, thank you for taking the time to do this tonight in South Africa. We really appreciate it. And um, we hope to hear from you again soon. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you.